Okay, so programming is hard. Well, I'm going to say it's hard. At least good programming is hard. Yet we seem to insist on using tools and practices which make it as difficult as possible. So um, my name's Mark. I'm here to talk about a tool called Enix. And I work for a place called Nicta, which if you saw Brian McKenna's talk yesterday, regrettably, I don't get to play with quadcopters all day. I build uh, uh, machine learning pipelines. Okay. So the enemy is the gramophone mind, whether you agree with the record that's playing or not. This is something I think about quite heavily when I'm building tools. It's the sort of thing where I feel like we flip from one tool to the other. Our current or old tools are horrible. Our next generation tools are amazing until they're horrible again. I, I, I want to take a more restrained approach and start thinking about what are the things that make those tools good, what are the things that make them bad. So Annex is kind of my experiment in trying to build a really refined tool uh, with a really refined set of practices so that when I build my next tool, I can reuse these practices and keep going. So motivation. I guess I probably need a fair bit of motivation. Uh, the world probably doesn't need another crappy dependency manager. Uh, so this is kind of my way of explaining how I came to uh, dedicating a large chunk of my time to writing a dependency manager. It's also one way of saying that, that I believe doing it all wrong, or at least I'm doing it all wrong. Hopefully everyone's doing better than me. So 2.0.1, uh, Jack fixed a bug the night after a release because, you know, 202, Jill went and fixed the three bugs that Jack introduced because he rushed. 210, uh, Jane shipped a new feature. It was great. It was awesome. 3.00, uh, marketing got a hold of it. It's a pretty horrible situation. <laughs> but surely this is a joke, right? Uh, we know a lot about the tools, the products we build. We know a lot about our projects. Yet we choose to pack all of this inf information to a ridiculous number with dots in it. And look, I'll, I, I sympathise, right? Semantic versioning is something that is the best of what the tools currently offer, but it's really not good enough and I'd really like to do better. So the next thing is, so since I've woken up this morning, I've shipped six different languages to production, some Scala, some Haskell, some R, some C++, some Shell, some Python. I've used eight different dependency managers to do so. But <laughs> I'm really over language wars. Uh, I'm really over the tools uh, exist in language silos. Uh, we build crappy tools in one language and then we jump to a new language and rebuild those same tools. Programming problems as tools, effectively, uh, I think we solve the same problem in every language all over again. So I want to build tools that are cross-language. So Annex's main goal is to be a cross-language dependency manager. So I can use it for Scala, I can use it for Haskell, I can use it for Shell, I can use it for R, I can use it for uh, managing dependencies between machines on Amazon. I can use it for managing uh, packages on FreeBSD. Uh, all of these different things. Time, uh, it's really important. Uh, so for a typical scenario for some given artifact, I think this is probably somewhat realistic depending on your perspective, but we have a situation where you commit some code, uh, we go through, uh, it might run through some CI, uh, we publish that, and we probably stop recording information about the little, the little color change there, and then we start forgetting about things. But after that, we do some platform testing, we ship it to production, uh, we do some performance testing in production, we get some performance numbers back. Eventually, uh, we let somebody write in C, so we got a vulnerability as well, it was great. Uh, but the, the point is, is that we, we stop recording information about our dependency so early in our life cycle, and we have all this other useful information that could be fed back into the dependency chain. So I want to embrace the fact that things change over time. So this is really important. And my last motivation is uh, I'm a little bit sick of closed world assumptions. So I'm going to pick on a particular tool here, uh, uh, Nix, because it's the new hotness that everyone really likes because it has the qualified of reproducible builds. right? And it's not a problem specifically with Nix, but I'll just use it as an example is that uh, this problem leads us to burn the world situations where we have to pretend that everything that currently exists doesn't. Uh, we have to use Nix all the way down or we get subtle issues that make our builds not reproducible. So any tool, I think, has to accept that there's an open world. There currently exists a bunch of dependency managers. We have to interact with them. We have to be able to pull artifacts with them in a sane way. 
So basically, we have to assume that we can't control everything from end to end, and what's the best way to manage that? So that's really important. But the end of all this is the dependencies cost too much. Right now, every time we pull in a dependency to one of our projects, we think really hard, and often we just don't. I want to get to the point where I can split code bases, I can do dependency management on a hugely fine grain uh, up to, like I want to be able to depend on a function as a dependency. That would be great. But at the moment, they just cost too much to do that. OK, so the concepts of Annex. Here is a typical uh, graph of a small set of projects that I work on. Uh, Napoleon's a top-level project that does some data management. Uh, Boxer is a project which uh, does some hard lifting, heavy lifting uh, batch operations. Snowball does some customer management. And Eminence does some identity management. So we have a little triangle, a uh, little diamond, where there's a few dependencies. So this example will come up a few times. But it's also important to realize that any single dependency graph exists in a larger dependency graph. You just choose not to worry about it sometimes. So outside of this, uh, there's a Haskell web app, Snowball. It depends on why, which depends on the Haskell base. Uh, it depends on Postgres, uh, which depends on libpq, which depends on the operating system, which depends on a C compiler. Uh, it, this all, there are more dependencies than you can possibly imagine. And it keeps going on and on and on. So we have graphs inside of graphs inside of graphs. We just choose to draw boxes around certain points. So the first thing is Annex is, is a fact store, right? So we want to st store a bunch of knowledge around what a dependency is and all of our dependencies at the same time. So how we do this, we start with something that we can store. We call this a family. So one of our projects, uh, Boxer. But because we're living in the future, uh, strings are not really acceptable. So we have some data structures which uh, always represent everything as a unique ID, and the name is just some attribute that we attach to it later on, and we can change this if we want. So don't use strings. Uh, atoms are a particular instance of something that can be resolvable within a family. So uh, if we use our tra traditional semantic versioning, this might be boxer121, uh, which again translate to some atom ID. Okay, and then we start to uh, worry about facts. So a fact might be a git commit, it could be an API signature, so this is a more complex fact, so this isn't just a single value, it's a tree of all of the signatures of all of the dependencies of a single, single API, so that we can track the overlapping between two, two different libraries. So you might want to be able to say, a uh, question that I want to be able to say when I'm doing dependency management is, will something link, right? So this one exposes all of these API functions, this one uses some subset of it. Um, are they still compatible in that subset? So these rich API signature structures let us work that out up front. And then we can have arbitrary facts, things like feature flags and uh, stuff like that. And we ascribe facts to atoms, should be kind of obvious. We take a bunch of facts and put them against the atom, so we'll end up with Boxer. It might have this commit, this API signature, this feature. And then we ascribe them um, over time, so we'll have a single world which contains all of our, fa all of our families, atoms and facts, and uh, these worlds change over time. So if I want to learn something about Boxer, so for example, I tested on FreeBSD 9.1, I'll go along, I'll create a new world, so we, uh, everything's immutable over time, so you can always backtrack to the, the previous version, and so I can say that there's a new view of, of the world where Boxer has the tested attribute. So this kind of comes to one of the very important design decisions, uh, which is that everything should be predicated on uh, reliable and uh, reliability and predictability. So the whole idea that we never ever update a fact in line, so nothing ever, uh, version one of the world will always be exactly the same as version one for everybody else for at all time. So you have to explicitly manage your time and it makes things predictable. And this is important on design decision in general for tools and uh, specifically for Annex. So the next thing is Annex is a data store. So because we uh, want to interact with other dependency managers or, and interact with the open world doesn't mean we have to trust it. So at no point do we ever download something randomly from the internet. Uh, this is a pretty important principle, but it seems obvious. But yeah, so we can also, uh, as well as uh, attributing facts to atoms, we contribute artifacts. So this might be a source tarball, it could be a binary, it could be have multiple artifacts with different tags. If 
but you might end up with something like this. So it might be an executable. It might have been built with this flag and it'll have this address, which I'll get to in a second. So there are a few important parts about artifacts. We want to be able to, I'll talk about it a bit later, we want to be able to substitute uh, bin binary artifacts for source artifacts and source artifacts for binary artifacts. So the amount of information required to know about an artifact, such as all the flags and all the dependencies it was built with, is kind of important. So you can know whether you can do substitution or not. The address is basically the content address, so it's just a hash of the actual binary. Okay, so that's important for how we store things. So effectively, uh, the data store part is just a content addressable storage where you can store things locally or remotely. Uh, does, everyone, uh, does anyone not know what content addressable storage is when I say that? Okay, so, uh, so basically content addressable storage is the idea that uh, you have a data store of some sort. Basically, the only way to get to the actual value in one of, the, one of your values is by knowing what data was there. So you do this by taking a hash of the actual data and you store the blob of the file at the hash, like effectively, right? So if we have a look at here, we'll take some artifact, we'll put it at NX storage slash the hash. There'll be some metadata so I can backtrack and clean things up if I need to, but that's basically it. Okay, and this gives us some free predictable caching. So I can sync things locally uh, uh, from a remote server without ever having to do it, which leads to a really important design decision for me, which is that never ever download something onto somebody's machine uh, if it's already there, ever. So I come from Australia, we don't really have internet yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is really, really, really important. Um, please don't download something if it's already on somebody's machine. So, cool. So the next thing is Annex is a language. So as a language, it's a it's a logic language. Uh, I have a history of logic languages. I don't like them anymore, but I wrote another one anyway. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a fairly simple language. It basically lets us specify dependencies. So I'm showing you a surface syntax here, but the language is actually defined instead of an AST and some data structures so that it can be represented in multiple languages. But this is just a simple, uh, hopefully easy to understand surface syntax. So effectively, I can say, uh, let's depend on Boxer and I want to get something that has this feature, has this commit in it, in its history, uh, was built from this branch. Uh, Snowball, I just want it to be compatible with some other atom, that, so, so some previous build I want it to be binary compatible with. Uh, Napoleon, still on semantic versioning, so I can use the semantic versioning facts. Okay? So uh, it's basically a logic language that lets me specify my constraints in a more interesting way. It also has a first class notion of time. So I can say that when I'm running this query, I want it to run against this Annex server at this point, at this version. Okay, so versions don't quite look like this, but it's somewhat representative. And then you can also have across time at different hierarchies. So it might be just Napoleons at that version or something like that. And then you can also do uh, more interesting cross time queries. So whilst you might want to query at the same time every time to get reproducibility for some world, there might be some things that are important that you want to know all of the current knowledge. So I want to, I want to resolve all my dependencies as at last Tuesday, because that's when our official build was, and I'm going to continue to do that. But I also want to have a secondary check, which means that there's no vulnerabilities reported against any of my dependencies ever. So in six months, if one of my uh, dependencies has a vulnerability reported against it, this will start to fail. But it will just be, that's it. Uh, so that's kind of important. Okay, uh, it assumes something. So this part here means that if you do a cross time dependency, you have to be quite careful about it because that part is not reproducible, right? Because you're looking at a mutable pointer, right? But everything else is reproducible. Okay, so this leads to another design decision, I guess, which is that precision is important. So there are lots of different ways which uh, dependency managers have gone in terms of uh, making it easy for users. Uh, most of the time, we trade rigor and flexibility quite heavily. So we either have to go entirely flexible where we specify version bounds and stuff like this, and we get very little reproducibility or we and have secondary mechanisms to give us reproducibility, or we go the rigorous route where we have to specify very precisely what we, what we mean, even though that's not really what we're interested in. So the design decision that is important to me is that users only have to specify what they care about at a particular point in time, okay? And so whenever we have flexibility, we never trade it at cost of determinism. 
So that's what we get by having immutable views of the world. Uh, even though we have a dynamic query across some ranges, it's always reproducible as at the same point in time in the world. Okay, and then the last thing that Annex is is a tool, right? So it's actually a dependency management tool. So it has a command line tool where we can go and uh, fetch dependencies as at some point in the world, uh, or it'll just pick up the Annex file in the current directory, or more likely you'll say once that I want to depend on these things at this point in time in the world, uh, minus U just says remember this, and then after that it'll write out a stable file with just that, that information in it, and I can then just say Annex fetch, and then the next person who goes and checks out my project, they'll go Annex fetch and get the exact same things, but I haven't had to specify very much. Maybe I haven't specified anything, just the names of the things I depend on. Okay. So one important point that I possibly glossed over a second ago is that I really would implore people to never ever generate a file that somebody wouldn't write by hand. So a common thing in dependency management is the notion of a lock file, uh, basically where you resolve a dependency graph and then you write down the exact version of everything in that graph. Okay? This means that instead of having a file such as this, where I just specify the version of the world, you have maybe your 450 dependencies all specified with git hashes and lots of information. This leads to a lot of problems. Uh, most specifically, if you can't write it by hand, you can't reason about it in a sensible way. So if I want to change it so that I want to run two different queries at two different points in the world, uh, it's very difficult to understand what's going on when you're trying to compare two lock files. There's just too much information. So try not to generate a file that somebody wouldn't write by hand. That's my two cents. And the other thing is that we get uh, a few nice properties so that because of the whole we don't download things twice, if I fetch at some point in time, then fetch at some other point in time, and then fetch again, uh, that will be instant by design because everything will have already downloaded. We can just resolve it again. Okay, then there's a bunch of other commands, so for creating atoms, uh, adding facts. And then we have deeper tool integrations. So we have things like uh, you want to just add facts to your git commits, so something like what GitHub does where you can close, uh, close a commit with a fix tag. You can also just add annex features or annex uh, attributes or facts in the git commit, and then there's a tool to say pull a facts from the head. So on CI server we run something like this, it says, uh, whenever we do a CI build, take all the facts that are in the current Git repository and push them to Annex so that we can use them for resolution next time. And you don't have to do it as a part of the commit. You can also add them after. So using like Git notes, you can just annotate a commit, say, like, here's a feature. So these sort of tool integrations are really important. I think we should be leveraging the current tools that we use a fair bit more. So every time we do it, we use a lot of tools. So. Uh, I'm trying to do this for Mercurial and Git, and I'll probably let other people do it for other tools, but integrating is good. But probably don't be as bad as Git. So if you're going to write a command line tool, um, don't use Git as your standard. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, there, is probably, there is probably also uh, some useful information here, which is that uh, we do deep integrations with tools. So part of it is that uh, so I write a lot of Scala and I write a lot of Haskell, and both, they're probably two of the worst dependency managements in existence. Um, so we have fairly deep integrations with both of those. So in SPT we can declare Ivory uh, Annex dependencies directly, and in Cabal we have to shim things. So we have a Cabal Annex file which specifies dependencies in a slightly different way and generates the real Cabal file. But uh, that's just more deep integrations. Okay. So moving on to a deeper look of how things work. So what does resolution actually look like? So this is kind of a world. I'm sitting here, I'm wanting to resolve some dependencies. There are some uh, public fax stores out there. There's a public data store. Uh, the Git repository itself can also be a fax store. So we don't have to have some server in play. It can just be we store some fax in the Git repository. So we'll retrieve fax. So whenever we're going to resolve a query, we'll retrieve fax. Uh, we'll retrieve facts from here, and then we may send, send a query. So the query itself can get resolved uh, partially on the client and partially on the server. So it will negotiate how it's going to do that. And then we'll synchronise any artefacts we need to a local store. 
and then I'll link them in. So how this plays out in development, uh, there's a few kind of flows that are important. So the first one is like time-based resolution. So one of the main use cases that I had when I first started designing NX was uh, basically I wanted to be able to test multiple dependency resolutions at the same time and build some tooling around that. So what that means is that if I have this dependency graph and uh, like there's some defined in NX in some way, it's pretty minimal. Um, and then I can have two different CI builds. So I can have CI stable, which calls NX fetch and does a build of the artifacts as at the last point in time that they were built so that I can have reproducible builds. And then I can have an NX edge, which goes and refetches all my dependencies as at the latest knowledge to working out whether everything still builds. And then we end up with uh, NX being able to display certain things about versions. So NX at world one, two, three, if I want to go and resolve Napoleon, I know that this will work. I know that at some point, somebody introduced some fact or constraint that meant that I'll never be able to resolve Napoleon at 124. So I'm not sure if anyone's ever wanted to do this, but I find this quite painful when I ever go to use a new project. Uh, it has seven dependencies. So we use the R language, and you go to RPAN, and it just like lists five dependencies with no version constraints. And you're like, oh, which ones should I download? Which ones will work together? Um, we should be able to work that out up front without ever having to run, any, run anything on our machines. So this is kind of traffic light system to be able to do that, which is useful. Yep, which is kind of. So an open world. So the other thing that we have is like, how do we interact with the outside? So Napoleon's a web app, uh, uses uh, Y, which is a uh, simple Haskell web framework, and it uses some JavaScript files, okay? So how we do this is that uh, we don't want to, I'm not expecting people who write Y to all of a sudden use NX. I'm not expecting the people who write underscore JS to go and start using NX directly either. So we have a situation where we can say, well, let's actually pull Y out of Hackage, which is the Haskell package manager, uh, at, some, some, at some semantic version. And I want to pull uh, underscore off CDNJS at some semantic version. So this is kind of how we start to interact with the world. What will happen is when Annex resolves this, it'll say, oh, I know how to pull in facts from these things. I will then pull it into the Annex store so that I have a canonical hash for this so that I know that it's reproducible even if the other things mess up. And then I can then start adding facts that I know. So I might test underscore on IE4 because I have to ship something on IE4. I don't really, but <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's amusing. Uh, so on underscore, I can start adding extra facts even though these things are stored in some external repository. And this is kind of useful for us. So I think that we should be thinking about this back to my open world concerns. So I think we should be thinking about how we interact with less principled systems. So if we're going to go off and design things that have reproducibility and all these nice principles, we don't want to eschew the current world, even if we think it's less principled than we currently are. We should be working out ways to interact with it. So source substitution. Uh, this one is a flow that comes up when I'm running Scala quite a bit. I have, we largely use binary dependencies in Scala where we have a set of projects. We have like 30 projects in my company and uh, we depend on binaries for all of those projects, but occasionally it comes up that we want to make a change that crosses one of those boundaries. So I want to make a change in some subsequent project. So it might look like this if we depend, well, if we depended this for Scala. Uh, I was working on some feature up here. All of a sudden, yep, I've got some dependencies and all of a sudden I need to fix a bug down here or do a performance fix or something like that. Uh, basically, I just want to say NX fetch but substitute source uh, and it knows from the NX file, it'll know how to build these. And then uh, I can also ignore the constraints if it violates them. Okay, and so then I can go and make my change in the transitive dependency and add something like when I commit my fix, I can just add something that says I must have fi this commit. Or if I add a uh, fix tag, I could say must have this fix. And now I can just go and resolve and test without ever having to worry about these transitive dependencies. And I've never had to worry about the workflow, or very painful workflow of going to Eminence, building it, getting a new version number, going to Boxer and Snowmall, updating their version numbers explicitly, and rolling it up in a cascading fashion. Uh, I want to avoid this as much as possible. So source, sub source substitution is important from a development workflow. Yep. And never had to touch these. 
Next one is binary substitution. Uh, this one comes from uh, writing C, C++ and Haskell more. So binary substitution is the idea that we use source dependencies most of the time, so we build on lots of platforms. Uh, when we, we generally build our dependencies when we uh, need them on a specific platform, but this is really slow. We generally only have five or six different machines, probably not even that much. Um, why are we building the same thing over and over and over again? So binary substitution is the idea that uh, we can predict what an artifact is gonna look like before we build it and uh, copy in some, some artifact that somebody's already built. This is far more difficult than it sounds, but it is possible. So it requires deduction of the output signature. So basically, basically what compiler it is, all the flags and everything, and also the transitive dependency of all the closure, uh, the, uh, the transitive closure of all the dependencies. So uh, if we have Napoleon, it's actual output signature is gonna depend on the version of Eminence you're linking, the version of Boxer, because uh, you get inlining in compilers, so if you have any optimization flags, uh, parts of these code bases will be inlined and it'll affect the signature. So it's quite difficult to predict, but you can do it. Yeah, and um, this is something that Nix does really well, well, somewhat well, which is that it, can, it has all the tooling in terms of being able to predict these signatures and can help out quite a bit. So, distribution. The next thing is that we, if you, we assume that Annex will have multiple fax servers. There'll probably be some global one and then companies will have their own and uh, projects will have their own. Then there's gonna be multiple, multiple fax, fax stores. And one of the important parts of Annex is time. And time in distributed systems is hard, especially linear time. So how, how do we actually manage that? So the short answer is that we cheat. Um, but basically, instead of doing a fully distributed system, we do a federated system. So if you have seen any time that I've written some version number or some time query, I've also had some given store attached to it. This is basically saying, this is the master of this version of time. So each, a version of time is tied to a store, and so I can uh, progress these at different rates and synchronize them on the client. Uh, this is possible. So, but it does give us some nice properties. So we get infinite read replicas still, so all of these servers can have this version on them. It just means that when we go to write fax, if we're gonna write out a new read version, we can only write it and get commit through one of the servers. Uh, uh, ideally, we'd like to do better than this, so we're kind of working on a non-linear view of fax, where basically the fax are a set that always commute so that we can uh, basically have a fully distributed system where you can add facts and get new versions, um, but it's not quite working at the moment, but that's something we're trying to do. The next thing is trust. Uh, I'm just gonna mention this quickly because I did a run of this talk a few weeks ago and everybody in the audience all of a sudden started caring about trust. They actually currently download things from Maven Central, like over HTTP, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought it was kind of funny, but we'll see. So we have uh, authenticated family and atom owners. So uh, basically, this means that when you register a family or you register an atom on a, on a server, you get the permission rights to that family and that atom. Uh, there can be different uh, lineages of atoms with inside of a family, uh, but you get some, owner, some ownership. And then you can also sign facts. So if you want to contribute a fact to somebody else's atom, you can sign that and put it in, and then people can choose to trust certain signatures or not. And then we get mediation of fact views. So uh, if I wanted to have, so I work, place of, the group I work in is Ambiata. Uh, if we wanted to have our own little fact store which proxies other fact stores, I can then restrict it so that I can say, I only want to import facts that are owned by some subset of people or signed by some sub subset of people, uh, which is kind of important. <laughs> cool. Um, so then we have uh, the solving problem. So. I won't go into too many details, but basically how solving works is that we take the logic language, we compile it down into an expression that can be run through a SAT solver. So this is a large problem because SAT solvers at the moment are optimized for a problem which is slightly different, which is much larger computations. So most SAT solvers are written in C or C++. They're basically black boxes. Uh, at the moment, I'm considering writing my own. Uh, at the moment, we just delegate to one of the standard Haskell ones. 
but the problem is, is that I want to be able to distribute computation over both the client and the server. And at the moment, there is no way to tease these SAT solvers apart in a reasonable way to do partial computation on the client and server. So this is kind of an outstanding problem and one of the holdups for me actually doing a proper release. So that's it. Yep, so uh, the main challenge in mapping the equations to facts, it's not too bad, but effectively you just have to come up with an integer representation of every single uh, fact in your system, which given that in a dependency system we might have a million dependencies, each one has 10,000 facts, uh, in the scope of things it's not that computationally expensive. Okay, cool. And secondary challenge is uh, caching and parcel, partial app solutions, which is what I was kind of getting at with potentially writing our own SAT solver. Uh, we really want to be able to ca uh, cache computation. So the chance of if I run uh, some sort of dependency resolution algorithm, it's going to have some computation that pretty much everyone on my team is going to run at some point. Recalculating this over and over, over again is redundant and prefer not to do it. So the last bit about the solver, which is kind of important, in terms of reproducibility, the biggest variable is Annex itself. So this is kind of important. So at the moment, we have a mechanism to assume that I'm not going to get it right the first time, uh, which is unlikely. It will be right. <laughs> but um, basically, in Annex, we'll have uh, an Annex resolver, which we can specify has version 1. And this is implicit at the moment. And I write it out as metadata so that Basically, I'm making the promise that every single time I do a fix to the solver, I will keep the old version as well, such that you get full re reproducibility. So this is a pretty large issue, uh, but this is kind of how I'm doing it at the moment. So basically, we have resolution, uh, and we want to be able to do it again and again and again. So bug compatible for resolvers um, specified through the Annex file. OK, so look forward. So once I started, I originally started doing this just to improve my development workflow. Uh, but as I started doing it, lots of interesting things have cropped up and I keep getting more and more ideas for what I'd like to do in the future. So this section is more about pie in the sky type thing, but they're things that I really am thinking hard about and would really like to do. The first thing is uh, much deeper analytics. So there's a few parts to this. So uh, we want to be able to do arbitrary queries and reporting over atoms. So if anyone's ever had a CI server there for 12 months and they've ever wanted to ask it questions, but it's like got a bunch of log files that are sitting there doing nothing, this is the sort of thing I want to get away from. All of that information can be packed in as facts in Annex against Atoms and then we can start, start doing better reporting. I want to say, how many times have I, how many times have I got something to production that uh, had failed the three builds before, for example? But these are all information and all facts that can be attributed to dependencies. And we'll be able to start building analytics and queries at the top of that. So then we want to be able to get inference of relative uh, facts from customer issues. So one of the things is, is that when a customer issue comes in, we track it back to a version. That version has a long history. Uh, it might have had other issues raised against it. It has a dependency tree that might have had issues raised against it. So starting to automatically infer or pull forward information when we see one of these would be pretty interesting. And then uh, this one's very pie in the sky, but I'd like to be able to predict failures in advance. So there's a few types of facts that I've already seen patterns, which if a fact exists or if some property exists, uh, that it's more likely to see a failure in produ uh, production. So the number of people that um, touched a commit, the number of red builds before the last, before, uh, the last green that got shipped. Uh, there are a lot of failures uh, that can be predicted based on the sort of facts that are coming into the system. So I want to be able to do this and rely on this information. So that's kind of important. Fixing all the compilers. So <laughs> all of them. So this is a call out to anybody who designs a language. There might be a few people here. So one of the things that uh, has made my job more difficult than I think it should be is that languages don't think about compatibility in very rigid ways. So any compiler that gets written, I think, should have the notion of signatures. It should have the notion of source compatibility, binary compatibility, if that's relevant. Uh, but it's really, really important. So uh, Haskell is going through a growing pain at the moment where people are trying to backwards compatibly add these idea of signatures, but it's really complicated because it wasn't thought about up front. 
basically I want all compilers to start outputting metadata which tells us signatures for functions and how they can be interacted with. I think this would be really useful. So fixing all the compilers is good. Uh, easier extent, extension via deductive rules. So at the moment there are a few ways to add global rules. Uh, so an example of why you would want a global rule would be that I write, I, I write a fact which says I tested on IE6. Rob writes a fact that was tested on Internet Explorer 6. Um, this is kind of not useful, but I can add a global deductive rule which says IE6 is the same as Internet Explorer 6, such that if anybody writes IE6 or anybody writes Internet Explorer 6, they get both facts. So you can query against either way. So, but I, I want to have a better mechanism for that. And then the community fact view, which I talked about before, such that we can fully distribute things. Okay. Uh, and the last one, which came up a little bit last week, was uh, better support for operational dependencies. So I use this a l or try and would like to use this a little bit in production. So managing dependencies between machines and services on machines. Uh, so there's a whole range of issues that come about with running something like this in production uh, that I'd like to solve. So that's kind of what I've got so far. I'm very close to having a release. Uh, this is more of a talk about how I'm building it, uh, but this project will be released as an open source project at some point. The reason why it's not is because I'm sick of having 80% complete projects on my GitHub account. <laughs> but uh, it's work in progress. But I think that most of the concepts here and the design principles that I've undertaken can be used by most people in lots of settings. So I'd encourage you to steal these ideas as much as you can. Thanks. Uh, there's a schema system, so there are a set of types of facts, so there's trees, there's trees and atoms and a few types inside of them. Uh, so you can have any fact that matches some sort of schema and those, the resolver knows how to take those schemas and map them to the SAT solver. Um, the extensibility problem is something I would like to solve at some point, but it's a fixed set of schemas for facts. There's a large number, but it's fixed at the moment. Yep. 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 No, absolutely, you are able to reproduce it. So perhaps glossed over that a little bit too much, which uh, the important thing is that, so, sorry. Uh, it's kind of important. So effectively, uh, this, so when you run this command, so annex fetch minus u, you do get a lock file, but it is something that I think a human can write. So you get, when you get, you get this lock file here, which is, this is the entire lock file, which says that here is the interesting owner of the server, and this is the time point. So is that um, like a linear incrementing integer saying, well, this is the nth time this is being built by someone with access to the server? Yeah, it's linear with respect to this server. Gotcha. Yeah, so if I run it, I can run that query again at this point in time at the server and it'll be fully reproducible. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and if somebody adds a fact, it'll be one, two, four or thereabouts. But yeah, so you still get full reproducibility, but you get it without having to generate a large lock file. Sure. Okay, so at the, well, uh, it's a binary protocol at the moment, which is defined internally, so I've made it, tried to make it as simple as possible. The client and server are both written in Haskell, but the protocol itself could be done in anything. Um, it's fairly naive. It do doesn't do anything complicated at the moment. Just basically, you can send lists and, and values, and there is a implementation that uses Thrift and an implementation that uses protobufs to do the same sort of thing. If and can I get transport security 
Sure, sure. Yeah, so the, it's using SSL basically for security at the moment for over those protocols, but nothing sophisticated. Yeah, so it uses signatures on individual facts to get an additional layer, but yeah. Sure. So do you have any ideas about like how, how would somebody go about uh, migrating a, uh, a system of projects that's already using like a, another uh, dependency management system? Yeah. So I have this problem. We have 30 odd projects that all use SPT, which is effectively the same problem as what Maven has. So our cur my current solution to this is that I do a deep integration with the tool so that it's somewhat easy. And effectively, uh, with SPT, that just means changing the tag, the key in Maven. It would mean writing a plugin which uh, reinterpreted the dependencies from one key to another. So you'd basically, instead of writing your dependencies and all of their semantic versioning, you'd write Annex dependencies and all of its, its artifacts. Annex would, the plugin would then go and use Annex to download things, and it would then register those as paths. But it would, I think from the Maven situation, it would probably require a deep integration with Maven to make it smoother. Uh, a lot of the tooling that I've built is designed around doing these deep integrations, so I don't think it would be that hard. Uh, for other languages, it gets a bit easier, so uh, we do it with Python and R and stuff like that by just replacing the dependency manager outright, because those tools are slightly less megalithic than what like Maven and SPT are. But yeah. So, so would you sort of like take the, the, Maven, uh, the Maven things, like say uh, a dependency from Maven, and does that get converted into a, into a, a fact automatically? Uh, yeah. Uh, so specifically with respect to that, so the current solution is that effectively I have a process which scrapes Maven Central and creates atoms for everything on Maven Central and register to those, then we can add extra facts to those. So I have a few processes that scrape Maven Central, uh, say it scrapes Hackage, scrapes uh, PyPy, and a bunch of other things so that it uh, doesn't take any of the artifacts directly, but it just scrapes them, creates metadata for them so that I can pull them in at a different stage. So uh, it occurs to me that your facts are an awful lot like RDF triples. Yep. And your query language is an awful lot like Sparkle. Yep. I'm not sure. I'd probably have to talk. I'm definitely not an RDF or semantic web person. And I've talked to a few people, so a few few people are right into it at work. And uh, my large problem that I've had is I, I think I just don't have the technical background in that area to understand the subtleties. So it, the model is extremely close with the exception that the computation I want to do is distributed, which I'm not really sure how to do that with Sparkle exactly. But um, maybe I can take it offline and ask you some more questions to be able to answer that better. Uh, snowball. So there's uh, so the resolution algorithm will pick. Uh, there are some heuristics around preferences, but it will pick something that satisfies the constraints of all three. So, so all three would have their own constraints on top of eminence, and it would pick the version of eminence which has the latest time, effectively, the basic heuristic is the latest, that satisfies all of the constraints. And if it can't find something that satisfies all the constraints, it fails the resolution. Okay. Yeah. And you exclude it Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. No worries. Cool.